Hello and welcome to our special coverage here on DW News. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Sumi Somaskanda. I'm here with our political correspondent Nina Haza. And we're here today to talk about what is really a somber, somber milestone in Germany. Germany. Uh, Germany has now reached 100,000 COVID deaths. The pandemic really is uh, raging out of control right now. And we wanted to, over the course of the next hour, with you together, talk about uh, some of the heights and depths of Germany's pandemic coverage, uh, what the situation is right now to take stock of the situation and talk about where things head from now. So I want to encourage you to please put your questions in the chat. We're going to bring some of those questions uh, into our discussion here with Nina, and we're going to talk about all aspects of what has been happening here in Germany uh, with the pandemic. And Nina, just, you know, first of all, put this into context for us, 100,000 COVID deaths. I mean, this really is such a, a significant moment. It is. It is uh, something that everybody had feared would come, but uh, people weren't quite expecting it to happen quite so soon in November. Because, I mean, if you look back to the summer of 2020, we had days where two people died of COVID, five people died, you know, the rest of Europe was struggling massively. But Germany was doing OK last year. And so now we've got those 100... 1,119 people. Hmm. Those are individual people who have all died, and it is putting massive pressure on, of course, the um, politicians, on authorities to deal with this struggle. And the death number is not the only one that's bad. I mean, you know, the number of people having to be treated with COVID in the hospitals is so big that also the hospitals are warning that they're going to be overwhelmed very soon. Yeah, we're going to talk about all of that, what the situation is in the hospitals at the moment. First of all, as I said, the pandemic, um, this fourth wave is really raging out of control. Bring us up to date on, on where the numbers stand in Germany right now. Well, it is out of control. We've already mentioned the numbers um, of people who have died, but uh, we've got um, some 10,590 cases more than last Thursday, for example. So this is massively high numbers of daily incidences as well, you know, where people get infected. And um, this is something where... Um, Again, I've said already that many hospitals are warning that um, they will soon no longer be able to deal with the amount of people there. Now, if you look at Germany, um, what's also striking is that there's a big difference between the regions. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, unlike in other countries, um, health issues are dealt with in Germany um, on a regional level. They're not dealt with essentially on the federal level. So every region has its own answers. And when you look at uh, the number of vaccinated people, it is a, a stark difference between the northwest, shall we say, and the southeast of the country. You know, the number of people who are unvaccinated in uh, the southeast of the country is just, um, is just staggering. There are millions of people. So it's also very clear to people that we are not going to get out of this situation by just hoping for more people to get vaccinated because there's a strong unwillingness, a sort of a resistance in the mm -hmm. population in certain parts of the uh, country um, to get vaccinated. So the situation is not going to get a lot better if drastic measures aren't taken. I want to come back to the situation in the hospitals. And there's a question uh, here on our chat that I'm going to bring in in just a moment. But first of all, give us an idea of, of what the situation is, because from the very beginning of the pandemic, when we saw those horrific images coming in from uh, northern Italy of hospitals overflowing, people being treated in corridors, uh, lawmakers here, uh, chief among them Angela Merkel, the chancellor, now outgoing chancellor, said we cannot have uh, the situation here where hospitals have to essentially decide who's going to get treated. And at that point, which will We'll get to, I think, a little bit later, Nina, uh, Germany was still handling the situation well. Now, are hospitals overwhelmed? Some of them are warning, yeah. In the state of Saxony, which is in the east of the country, they're warning that n from next week onwards, um, their intensive care units are going to be so full that they're going to have to make the decision whether they can continue somebody's treatment in an ICU um, or whether that patient who's currently being treated in the ICU will have to make way 
for a COVID patient who has a better chance of survival. That's the sort of triage concept that we're talking about. This is, of course, an extremely difficult moral questions, and there's a big discussion amongst all sorts of experts here. We've got an ethical council who've also given their input, you know, that this is something um, that should be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Other people are saying, no, we need a law for that sort of a thing. But it just goes to show that it is such an overwhelming situation mm -hmm. that many of the hospitals can't even transfer their patients anymore to neighboring hospitals, to neighboring cities. And they've even reached the point where they're saying it's not enough. We can't even send them to the next region. So Germany has got this system where they've uh, divided the country up into five regions, where they're saying, OK, if people in Saxony can't be treated in Saxony anymore because there are too many COVID patients, then we'll just send them to another um, of the right. 16 regions. But even that system uh, is very close to collapse already. OK, well, the question that we have in our chat here, thanks for the questions, and please keep them coming. Uh, the question here from D. Z. K., uh, K rather, is the question, why are they saying our hospitals are crowded? I'm from Germany. I spent the last weeks in different hospitals. It is all okay here. So how would you respond to that question? Well, I think it's perfectly legitimate if you are in a region where lots of people are vaccinated mm. and where the numbers are low to say, hey, I really don't know what you're talking about. I just don't see the virus anymore, anywhere. My hospital is still doing OK. Well, yeah, consider yourself lucky, you know, but we've hear, uh, we've heard the, the cries from um, from intensive care nurses, from doctors who are all saying we um, we have to essentially act before everybody's overwhelmed and there are stark differences between the regions. So, yeah, I mean, if you are in a region where uh, the hospital is essentially still able to cope with all the patients, then, yeah, good for you. Um, and this is true for some regions in Germany here. But it's also a fact that there are hospitals that have rung the alarm bells and are saying we even lost a lot of nursing staff um, in this course of the pandemic because they're simply exhausted. So that's also the reality that we're facing here. A tragic turn of events. You know, in yeah. the beginning of the pandemic, Germany was actually taking in patients from other countries. Just to remind anyone who's just joining our stream, we are here today to talk about this really tragic milestone that Germany has reached, 100,000 COVID deaths. And we're looking at the pandemic and pandemic management really from all angles now uh, here with our political correspondent, Nina Haase. Nina, you know, we've talked a little bit, you've touched a little bit about vaccinated, um, unvaccinated. But let's go into some of the reasons that Germany is now reaching every day a new record when it comes to new COVID cases, this fourth wave that's kind of raging out of control. What got us here? <laughs> Well, a number of factors. Yeah, a number of factors, of course. I mean, uh, first of all, many people now agree that um, some people still don't take the virus seriously here in Germany because we were very lucky during the first, second and third wave. So there is not the sense of urgency as in other countries that were completely overblown by this by this massive first outbreak in the spring of 2020. So Germany saw the pictures from Italy and they did take drastic measures. There was a lockdown, you know, the kindergarten where my kids go, that closed for a month and everybody said, OK, stay at home, this is dangerous and we have to wait for a vaccine and uh, we have to then uh, sort of take that seriously. So that is a massive factor. People don't have the personal experience, mm -hmm. still not. Um, the second one is, of course, that uh, the measures that were put in place were sometimes not controlled in the right way. You know, you could find yourself um, in a supermarket where, technically speaking, there were only you were only allowed to go in there with 15 people and you saw yourself surrounded by another 30. So, sure. you know, nobody, there were no fines imposed. So people first didn't know what the measures were, really. Um, and the second one was also that, you know, they, you didn't get a fine. And then, of course, when we look at what happened this year, when we had the vaccine, um, people, uh, millions of people, are opting not to be vaccinated. Now, we'll probably look at the reasons why they didn't do that or why they're mm -hmm. not doing that. 
But that is a massive factor. And then, last but not least, um, we had the federal election in September. And experts agreed that the politicians, many of them took the eyes off the ball. There were still some politicians who warned and said, let's use those summer months that are crucial with warm temperatures, etc. We can prepare for the winter when we know that infections are going up anyway. But then uh, September's election uh, just kept all the politicians occupied. Okay, we have another question that's come in uh, on our chat, and I want to encourage you all to, to send as many questions as you can to us, because that's why we're here to take your questions and, and bring them into the discussion. The question here uh, is, should Germany have opened up in the summer like the UK did? Elaborate on how Germany handled parts of the pandemic compared to others. So, yeah, that gives us the opportunity to really look back at what you were just doing, kind of look back at the course of the last one and a half, two years. And you know what? I mean, essentially, uh, the question is, should it have opened up? And I got the feeling this summer, yes, the measures were still in place. You know, you were, strictly speaking, required to wear a mask, for example, on public transport. But how often were you checked here on the metro, on the subway in Berlin? And I wasn't checked once. There were plenty of people walking around who'd taken off their masks, you know. Uh, shops were open again, festivals started happening again, people started going to clubs again. So there was a lot of opening up um, that happened. And at the same time, there was also this feeling, we've had enough of this now, we want to um, choose the successor of Angela Merkel. So, you know, the, the focus was not on the COVID pandemic this, this summer. Okay, that's a really good point. Uh, hopefully, that answered that question. Uh, keep sending us more questions that you might have for us. Yeah, and uh, if I didn't answer it, then write back then to Then write me. back to us, exactly. <laughs> One of the other reasons that people have mentioned is the fact that Germany uh, is going through a political transition at the moment. Yeah, so there were the elections, uh, the new government, the three parties that were uh, essentially negotiating to, to build a new government together uh, were negotiating together on a daily basis, and that has left something of an interlude. Just yesterday, uh, the new government and announced that they had struck a deal, uh, that they came to an agreement. Uh, Olaf Scholz will indeed, as we all suspected, become the new chancellor. And this moment that was supposed to be a step forward and a look into the future was really overshadowed by this very dire situation uh, in Germany at the moment. I think we have a clip of Olaf Scholz uh, speaking just before uh, he, he laid out the new government's plan, the fact uh, that they had reached an agreement, uh, what he started with. So let's bring that clip in. The lag is ernst. The situation is serious. Last week, the future government and the federal states agreed on decisive steps to contain the pandemic. These measures are in effect as of today. Only those who are vaccinated, recovered, or, if necessary, who have a current negative test result, are allowed to attend events or go to restaurants or bars. We must vaccinate and issue booster jabs to make it harder for the virus to spread. I know we all had hopes that this winter wouldn't have to be a COVID winter. But despite the vaccinations, this is not yet over. Once again, we have to pull ourselves together, comply with the hygiene rules, keep our distance, and follow the mask mandate to get through this in one piece as well as we can. It's up to all of us to break this severe fourth wave. The new German government will do everything necessary to get our country safely through this time. Yeah, so Nina, this really stood out, this urgent appeal, before even presenting this agreement that they had reached. Um, what did you take away from the measures and uh, the perspective, the goals that he set there for fighting this fourth wave? Well, of course, the idea is to get as many people vaccinated as possible um, because, again, there are millions of people who are hesitant, reluctant or even completely objected to um, being vaccinated. And that is not going to help, you know, uh, come through, get through this winter if um, the virus can just rage on. So that is the one idea that Olaf Scholz um, stressed again. Then adhere to all the measures. And he also mentioned the fact that we've got those... Uh, what's called 3G rules here. I mean, if you want to know more about those 3G rules, then um, you obviously put put the questions in the chat. But um, 
it essentially means that uh, we are restricting access for people who are unvaccinated. So if you want, it's um, politicians and experts are saying we're currently dealing with this fourth wave of a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Mm. You know, they are the ones that are driving this massive wave. They are the ones um, that have a much higher chance of ending up in ICU. They are the ones that are essentially having to be treated in hospital. Because, of course, as a vaccinated person, you can also get the virus and you can transmit it, but you're not as likely to end up in intensive care, you know, having um, to be treated like that. So that is something where we are already seeing those intensive measures, but that is not enough, which is why Olaf Scholz also said that from now on, the German government is going to take, the new German government is going to take a new approach and they're going to set up a, um, a COVID crisis committee in the chancery. So that means that he's really making this a top priority and he has to because, yeah. you know, he had all these plans and the coalition treaty, 170 odd pages long, is full of promises for the voters. And of course, you know, they want to bring the country forward, but they're starting off with this massive crisis. And so and there's going to be this crisis committee in the chancery that will be updated every day um, by experts who um, can also give recommendations on how to deal with this COVID pandemic. And frankly, Sumi, I find it astonishing that we're talking about this <laughs> one and a half years into the pandemic, you know, because what Angela Merkel and her cabinet did was um, they would have those regular crisis meetings, but they would happen every few weeks. And then the leaders of the regional states, all very important people, had to sit together for hours and hours and hours to discuss those measures. But they didn't, you know, they didn't have a, a committee in place that could be updated and uh, give recommendations on a daily basis. So that is high time frankly. Yeah, that clearly wasn't the most effective way to, to deal with the pandemic, because no, we've just been looking at uh, some pictures of Angela Merkel there. Um, there is another question here from Nitika Nanda, who wants to know, how effective is the antibody test? Could it be used as an additional strategy for allowing people to move around more freely? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, um, lots of experts here, health experts, are saying uh, that any test is good because it also gives people the opportunity um, to find out whether they're at risk of um, spreading the virus, mm -hmm. right, to other people. So if you have an antibody test um, and you find out that you've got antibodies, then you're n probably not as likely to pass on or to get uh, to get affected in quite the same way as somebody who hasn't been vaccinated, etc., or who hasn't had COVID before. But um, they all agree that still um, certain other measures are needed and social distancing is still required because you just can't be sure that you're not still going to uh, going to be infected and um yeah yeah that that is um, there is no way around it you can't be a hundred percent sure even if you know you know that you have antibodies you just don't know how your own body is going to react once it catches the virus but testing is a part of the strategy right yeah. i mean over the summer we saw germany and you know if you're not here you're watching us from from elsewhere germany rolled out these free uh, rapid tests across the country and that was an effective way to pe for people um to to test and see indeed whether even if they were vaccinated and had a breakthrough infection uh, whether they were carriers of the virus and could transmit it. But, you know, Sumi, I mean, if I, if I can just interrupt you yeah. here, but I think it's very important for us as well to tell our viewers here that we're sitting very close to each other and we're both vaccinated, but we've also taken our test. Mm -hmm. You know, that is just, it's just obvious that we don't think, uh, you know, we are vaccinated so we can now walk around the world freely and hug everybody uh, because we just don't know. Maybe we're carrying the virus, which is why it's a requirement here at DW, you know, that if you come in, even if you're vaccinated, you take your test. Yeah. There's another question that's coming in from some users who want to know, should Germany use the methods being implemented in Austria? And for anybody who's not familiar, Austria at the moment has essentially implemented a national lockdown because the pandemic there is also raging out of control and a mandatory, a vaccine mandate starting in February. Can and should Germany go down that path? Well, that is a million euro question, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, um, the big question is, can we avoid, so the two questions, can we avoid the lockdown for everybody? Um, I don't think we can, but, you know, it's still, 
it's still out there. The discussion is still out there, and um, many people are ruling out closing schools and kindergartens because they say that we saw during the first lockdown when schools and kindergartens were closed in Germany um, that it has side effects. You know, if you're um, on mental health issues, for example, you know, lots of other problems occur if you essentially um, close schools and kindergartens. You will have to uh, deal with long-term problems like the gap in uh, education levels varying, you know, lots of um, social problems arising potentially yeah. from children not being able to go to these institutions. So that is the idea. I think if we see the day where schools and kindergartens close in Germany, that's when everybody knows, OK, the situation is so terrible that nobody knows what to do anymore. Now, when it comes to Austria's idea um, to implement um, the compulsory vaccination, mm -hmm. that is also a debate that's starting here. And just last week, on Thursday, I think nobody would have thought that this week would have been the the week where we're starting to seriously discuss whether it's something that we're going to have to go for. But this week, uh, the number of people who are in favour has risen so dramatically. And now, you know, it, in Germany, of course, um, it, there's always the question, can you implement a law? You always have to be sure that it's doable and that it won't be overruled by the courts. Right. And there are some um, court proceedings that are still going on when it comes to other vaccinations. So, you know, they, they will have to wait for that to happen. But what they've already agreed on, the new government, is that uh, vaccination is going to be compulsory for um, certain professions. Mm -hmm. Like this this week, for example, the Bundeswehr, the German army, announced that it will make um, vaccination mandatory for soldiers. So if you want to work as a soldier in Germany, you will have to be vaccinated. And the same will go for people who work in elderly people's homes, you know, care homes. And that doesn't just apply to the people who actually look after the elderly, but also to cleaners, to cooks, et cetera, hmm. in those homes. A question along those lines is to why it's important to get vaccinated. We have one from a user who's asking, what are the, what's the percentage of non-vaccinated in the ICU? Um, and this is important to the user to highlight so that the unvaccinated will know that they are at risk. Yeah, I mean, obviously it uh, depends on where you look and I'm sure that we can also put all the links with all the detailed figures into the chat because I think that is a very valid point. You need to get your numbers right and um, I'm just getting numbers here that say that currently 70% of COVID patients in the ICU are not vaccinated and that is something... Um, where our public health institute has said that that is the number that they're working with, you know, the 70%. Yeah. And many people are saying, yeah, but you also find vaccinated people in ICUs. Yes, of course, because many people, you know, people can also get extremely sick if they're vaccinated. The thing is that you have to look at just how many people have been vaccinated and then look at how many people of this big group end up in ICU and how few people have not been vaccinated and the big group of people who end up in ICU. So, you know, it's not a guarantee that you won't end up in intensive care if you let yourself get vaccinated. But the chances are about 10 times higher. That is another figure that is really important to know. The chances that you'll end up with a really severe disease are 10 times higher if you're not vaccinated. That's why we've seen these appeals across, mostly, uh, almost across the political spectrum to get vaccinated, really rising. These calls, as you said, for mandatory vaccines, at least among some professions rising. And we've seen politicians, lawmakers, uh, decision makers uh, trying to find the right words in how to express how serious the situation is. And there was one from uh, Jens Spahn just last week, I believe, uh, where he was speaking uh, and he, he gave a statement that, that raised a lot of eyebrows. It was a particularly morbid statement. Uh, let's see if we can play that clip. Most likely, when the winter is over, everyone here in Germany, and this has occasionally been said with some cynicism, will be either vaccinated, recovered, or dead. But that's the end. Vaccinated, recovered, or dead. I mean, that is, again, I'm not sure how helpful a statement like that is to convince unvaccinated people to go get vaccinated, but clearly underlie, underlines or highlights uh, what the health minister sees as the urgency of the situation.
Yeah, I mean, he did leave out uh, the millions of children who can't get vaccinated right. or the people who have other medical conditions, you know, reasons, legitimate reasons for why they're not vaccinated. So that was a very clumsy comment. Um, it is questionable whether it is going to help the discussion because the uh, discussion is so emotional right now here in Germany. Um, and the whole issue is one that is deepening so social divide. So, you know, I think as a, a responsible politician, it is hard to find the right words. And uh, one of our leading health experts, uh, Christian Drosten from the Charité, who's one of the world's most renowned researchers when it comes to the coronavirus, has said that he's tired of sounding like a parrot, you know, because he's <laughs> repeating the same words. And he, they are all struggling to find new words to describe the severity of the situation. Yeah, absolutely. And this uh, effort to get more people vaccinated, that's one that's been ongoing, obviously. There are booster shots now being um, rolled out here in Germany. But I want to get to one question that we have here from Inez Schwarz, who wants to know, and this goes to the very heart of why there is a higher number of unvaccinated people uh, here in Germany compared to the rest of Europe. Uh, what happened to Germany? I thought they were intelligent and not to let conspiracy theories rule them. It is a very complex question. Mm. Um, and I think you, if we have the time, I think we do have to look into uh, Germany's um, tradition as well of being a country where everything does get discussed. Um, broadly, you know, we are a country that is trying to explore every um, advantage and disadvantage of anything that's happening. So that is, I think, something that is um, just genuinely not surprising about Germany that you would have this this kind of a debate and then um, political communication was not very good so that to many people who don't follow the news every day it was very confusing because the measures kept changing and you know mm. then there were messages about certain um, vaccines not being as efficient as others and then suddenly there was the question okay what is actually going to happen if I take AstraZeneca you know is it is it going to be dangerous and many people just felt that <clears throat> they didn't have the they didn't have the guidelines that they needed but then there's also a hardcore group in Germany now that's, uh, th that just questions science. It questions political authorities. It questions the media. And of course, these three um, groups of authority essentially have been the ones that have been communicating. But we saw uh, the rise of this group well before this corona pandemic. We saw it um, with the rise of the uh, Excuse me, the the, um, the populist um, uh, Pegida movement, the anti Islam so called anti Islamization movement in the East, you know, where they had the same um, ways of expressing their anger at the current authorities, mm -hmm. where they questioned everything that everybody said. And um, then also, the, this coronavirus pandemic has also given rise again to uh, the ideas of Rudolf Steiner. Um, that's Look one that up. you're going to have to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Look him up. But he is definitely one of the people that you might want to um, research. There's actually a DW video, by the way, uh, online at the moment that you'll find, I believe, <laughs> on our Instagram site as well, that you can see with more ex explanation to, to Rudolf China. But essentially, uh, he's this guy who promoted the idea that everything happens for a reason. And he was a well-known... Um, all-rounder who sort of said, OK, um, if we get sick, it is for a reason. Our body has to, to fight this. So this is, you know, more than 100 years ago. But he, he's got a strong following still. And some of his ideas were very progressive, you know, sort of a more complex uh, understanding of the human body um, where mind and body work together, etc. But definitely do look him up. And I don't think that we should um, spend too much time because there are other things that we should talk about now. But um, He's definitely one of the factors that explains this, uh, yeah, this yeah. Um, disbelief in medical science in yeah. Germany.
There, there certainly is a strong and deep tradition, some of you might know, of holistic medicine, alternative practices here in Germany. And there's been a lot written about uh, theories posited about the fact that that has led to some of the skepticism towards vaccines and the corona messaging. But you mentioned the fact that um, political communication wasn't uh, dealt with ideally, let's say, uh, here in Germany. What about in this fourth wave? We have, as as you said, we're, we're in this transition of this new government um, coming in. I mean, over the summer, Nina, you and I were both covering the, the German election, and there was very little focus um, paid to the coronavirus pandemic, the handling of the pandemic, and where things would go uh, from there. Why is that? Well, there were even calls to— um to announce their so-called Freedom Day as early as possible. You know, when when are we going to see the day, some politicians in the summer said, uh, where we can get rid of all the measures, you know, and give the people some prospects and give them some perspective, give them some hopes. That didn't just come from the far-right populist AFD party, by the way. That also came from one of the parties that is now probably going to form part of the next government, from the um, business-friendly, the liberal, FDP party. Um, there were a lot of politicians who said, OK, enough is enough. We've seen enough restrictions on our individual liberties. We need to come back to a sort of a normal lifestyle. And I think um, there were many people who really just didn't experience COVID anymore during the summer. You know, we managed, we did manage to bring down the numbers significantly yep. during the summer. And of course, it, it, this is the end of an era. I mean, Angela Merkel is going to leave. So this is not like any other election. I mean, we are trying out something completely new with this um, new government that's going to come into place, you know. So even people who are not normally interested in politics, I would say, suddenly found themselves actually quite interested in finding out, you know, who are those new people who are going to be our next bosses, essentially, or who are going to run the country. Um, so that is something where um, political communication just didn't happen, at least not consistently. Okay. Um, if you happen to just be joining us on the stream, I just want to explain that we're here talking about uh, this milestone that Germany's reached in the pandemic, 100,000 COVID deaths. And we're talking about what went wrong, where things stand, and where things are headed uh, in the future. So we are taking your, your questions. We've been bringing them in here. Uh, we do have another question here from Trebochet, who wants to know, why are the most vaccinated countries experiencing so many cases? Oh. Well, it would always be good to know um, what exactly they're referring to, um, because of course there are all sorts of statistics, and it's just I don't know, Sumi, if you if you have an instant response to this. Well, question. you can certainly say within Europe, um, countries with high vaccination rates like Spain and Italy are are not, or Spain and France rather, are not experiencing the the type of outbreak that Germany is at the moment, that Austria is at the moment. And if you look at the numbers within Europe, um, the German-speaking countries, so Germany and Austria uh, and Switzerland, have uh, the the lowest vaccination rates of all European country. So the fact that we are witnessing a large outbreak in these countries uh, certainly can be uh, linked to the fact that there is a lower uptake of vaccines here until until this point. Until about three weeks ago, I think the vaccination rate had really plateaued here in Germany at around 67 percent. Mm -hmm. Now, what this question might be referring to, of course, is um, the fact that there are many breakthrough infections as well. Uh, you mentioned the fact that that doesn't necessarily mean a breakthrough infection still uh, can mean with a vaccinated person that they have protection from a severe infection, mm -hmm. uh, protection from ending up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But these breakthrough infections, and perhaps that's what this user is, is referring to, um, is something that Germany is trying to counter now with this rollout of booster, um, mm -hmm. booster shots for, mm -hmm. for people. It does seem, however, that the organization of that is well, not the easiest at the moment. I know certainly people, anecdotally, plenty of people who are looking to try to make an appointment. And um, even though it was clear early on uh, and I think over the summer, Angela Merkel said, we need to get boosters rolled out. We need to make sure that uh, the vaccine centers get up and running uh, or make sure that they're up and running. Many of them started to close in the fall. In September, here in Berlin, certainly, the, the, excuse me, the vaccine centers um, were starting to close. I mean, that, again, seems to point to a lack of coordination or organization. Absolutely. Uh, it is something where um, 
many people are wondering why didn't we just keep them running because we knew that the autumn was going to come, you know. Um, but then if you are somebody who has to look at your budget and, you know, it is expensive to keep these things running and then you've got a couple of weeks where the demand is not as high, potentially, then of course, you know, you'll get all sorts of questions as well. So that is, um, that was a mistake. Berlin luckily kept two of them open. Mm -hmm. Berlin, you know, being Germany's capital and um, biggest city, etc. So uh, they didn't have to start from zero, but many places do. And also many doctors stopped vaccinating um, and they're now starting. And, um, you know, I know people who are older than 70 who now ring their local GP and the GP says, well, yeah, you can have an appointment in March because I'm completely overbooked. Yeah. And then this old person, I mean, in the first wave, Germany, I thought, did it, um, or it, sorry, during the first um, round of vaccinations, I think Germany adopted a pragmatic approach because we didn't have enough vaccines. So we said, okay, let's do the most vulnerable people first and everybody else has to wait you know, for a while. But now the most vulnerable people don't have that anymore. And that's what I don't understand. When it comes to the booster shots, they're not given priority at the moment. You know, instead they're, they're being asked to just ask their doctor friends or find out somehow on a dubious chats on social media, or, you know, yeah. where can Who knows I get what the doctor? vaccine? Yeah. And, and that is just, I mean, I saw a comment from somebody in the US who said you can walk into any any pharmacy, essentially, and just say, hi, can I get vaccinated now? And they say, yeah, sure, sit down. And that is just not, it's unthinkable here. People wait six to eight hours. I mean, that's what people normally here in Berlin spend waiting to get into the most popular clubs, yeah. but, you know. As, yeah, it is a problem. And there does seem to be a shortage, of course, also for these booster shots that some doctors' practices aren't able to uh, to, to fill the, the demand, let's say. Um, we've taken stock of where things are at the moment. If we look ahead and where things go in the next few months, because, you know, just a year ago at this time, Germany was staring down the barrel of this long, cold, hard winter with a very high caseload, uh, essentially a lockdown for several months where all businesses were closed, uh, establishments and locales and such. Uh, where do things have from now? I mean, is the new government, is it possible that they could issue a lockdown, that they could issue a vaccine mandate beyond certain professions like nurses and, and doctors and so on and so forth? Well, they've agreed. They've put forward a new law, which they had to correct uh, because it wasn't strict enough um, even before that law um, was passed in the new parliament. Um, so, you know, I mean, this new government is off on a it's facing massive challenges before it's even starting. I mean, they're not in power yet, but of course they are the ones who are having to set the guidelines for the next couple of months. So it is a tough job that they're facing. I mean, um, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult transition period. But that new law says that um, they agreed on a new metric. Um, if the number of people in hospital reaches a certain limit, then the regions can adopt really strict measures. And that includes limiting uh, contacts, you know, all the restrictions that we saw during the first wave bar the um, option of closing schools and kindergartens. That is something that they really do want to keep open this time around. But everything else, they can restrict access for the people who are not vaccinated at a certain level. And then they can, um, they can essentially cancel big events, like many places have um, now cancelled their famous Christmas markets. You know, I mean, all these people uh, who'd been hoping uh, that after last year when everything was cancelled that this year we would finally with that vaccine in place you know that we would finally have the chance to go to Christmas markets possibly wearing our masks and showing our COVID certificates but even that is no longer possible in the regions um, where uh, you know this is something um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, not possible in places like Bavaria that's mm. already cancelled all these Christmas markets. And you said, and we'll just highlight that again, there is now a new crisis team that will be anchored uh, in the government as well. I mean, is there any sense or indication that perhaps some of the management issues when it comes to political communication, uh, procurement, or at least the rolling out of vaccines, booster shots, that that, that might be handled better than it has been in the past year and a half? 
Well, I mean, the health ministry will, um, of course, be given to um, somebody from the Social Democrats now. You know, mm -hmm. um, Jens Spahn, the current health minister, is a member of Angela Merkel's government. So um, there is, of course, there's always this big expectation that if you take over a job like that in a crisis like this, they will have to find ways of proving that they can do it better than their predecessor, obviously. Um, so whether they're going to manage that, I don't know, but uh, they, that is definitely something, the political communication and uh, the management that doesn't just look at whether broad measures work for a couple of weeks and then they sit down together again in an emergency meeting and frantically work on wording, etc., only to then come out, and this happened with all the Merkel meetings with all her regional leaders, where they then came out and said, look, sorry, but I'm not going to stick to what I just signed up for uh, just two hours ago. You know, in my region, I'm going to do it differently. So hopefully we won't see any of that anymore. Well, Nina, we're just going to actually be wrapping up here in just about uh, 30 seconds or so. But I wanted to thank everyone on the chat for, for being with us, for sharing your questions with us. Um, just very last question from me, Nina. How much will this pandemic be dominating what the new government uh, aims to do in the next, let's say, three, four months? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I already said basically that they've got all these projects that yeah. they want to get through, you know, they want to make Germany a much more liberal country. They've got all those plans, you know, allow for multiple citizenship, bring down the voter age to 16. But you've got to have time to actually do these projects. And right now they will be dealing with breaking the fourth wave. Well, this is Nina Haas, our political correspondent. She's been taking us through this, these last 45 minutes talking about this uh, really somber milestone that Germany's witnessed, 100,000 COVID deaths. We've been talking about where things are and where things are headed. Thank you again for joining us on our stream, for sharing your questions, and make sure that you join us for the next time that we come together in this constellation and continue to send us your questions. So we'll see you soon.